Hi, my name is Dr. Alan Barnard. I'll be co-presenting today with Jakobin Vosloer, the Vice President of Simulation for Goldberg Research Labs. The title of our presentation today is Using a Project Portfolio Digital Twin, a full simulation model that we've developed at Goldberg Research Labs to show the impact of TOC's critical project management rules. And we will be specifically focusing on a case study regarding a gas turbine manufacturer. At the end of our presentation, we will be available for a chat or additional questions and answers in the chat room immediately after the, this presentation. Just a brief introduction of Goldet Research Labs. We are really passionate about helping organizations uh, answer two simple but important questions. How much better can you do, a little or a lot? And how best to do it? What is the simplest, fastest, lowest cost and lowest risk way of doing it? We have worked over the last decade or so with a number of, of Fortune 500 companies all around the globe. And we also have a number of research partners that often work with us on these large scale projects. The agenda for today is I will start off with the challenges that we face as managers that are managing a project environment, why we decided to use simulation, how does it help to overcome those challenges. Uh, I'll present the introduction for this case study for this gas turbine manufacturer. I will then cover what are the decision mistakes we can make in managing projects that we are aware of, avoidable and consequential decision mistakes, and then how the critical chain project management rules can help to avoid these. I will then hand over to Jakub Ben, who will then do a demonstration of the project portfolio simulation model that we've developed. Uh, after the demo, he will hand back to me and I will share with you some really exciting results that we achieved from the simulation model and then we will open it up to Q&A. So let's get started. So what is the generic business challenge? In a project environment, project managers are really responsible for three things. The first part is they have to make reliable commitments on both project due dates as well as on budgets. Secondly, they have to decide what rules to use, how are they going to plan their portfolio of projects and programs and phases and how will they execute those. And of course, we know that things will go wrong. So when there are delays or defects that might require rework on their projects, what changes are they going to make to recover and or should they be changing the original commitments. I think a, a practical example of this, imagine you are leaving your home to meet a, a customer. It's an important customer. You have about 30 miles to travel and you can travel on average typically at about 60 miles an hour. So in ideal conditions, you, it should take you about uh, 30 minutes or so to get to the customer. Now, you cannot be late, so you decided to leave a little bit earlier. You've given yourself about 15 minutes of buffer, so you left about 45 minutes before you have to be there at the meeting. And you're starting to make progress, and, but the traffic is a little bit heavier than what you expected. And you expected to get there in 30 minutes. You've given yourself a, an additional 15-minute buffer. So you'd expect, okay, after 15 minutes, which is about half, half the time, a third of your total time that you've estimated, you should, under ideal conditions, have covered half the distance, about 30 miles. What if you realize that you've only covered 15 miles? Well, what are you going to do? Um, are you going to decide to take a different route? Now, you, of course, have a GPS with you. So the... The original routing that the GPS provided was the most optimum route and that gave you a, a feedback that it should take you about 30 minutes to be there. Um, will you change your route? And if you do, what's the chances that you might get delays on that route? Or are you going to be changing your commitment to your client? Uh, as you're starting to make progress and you're starting to run out of time, when will you start making changes to your commitment? And these are the type of day-to-day -day decisions and conflicts that 
not just project managers, but all managers face is I need to add some safety so I can make reliable commitments on both time as well as budget. I need to decide how best to achieve the commitments that I've made. And lastly, if there are going to be delays, if there is going to be defects or rework that's required, what recovery actions, if any, should I take? Should, will my buffer be big enough to absorb those so I don't overreact and start turning the, the, the reacting to the noise? And at what point do I really need to start changing my commitments? These are really fundamental questions that all managers face. So why is the current tools that we've got available, why is it inadequate? In the project environment, we have project management software, we have spreadsheets that we can use. But these, like with the operational environment or supply chain environment where we have ERP systems and spreadsheets, of course, they cannot fully consider what we call VUCA, which is an acronym for the things that make management interesting. Really complicated, very tough. VUCA is for volatility. There's gonna be volatility changes in both the demand and supply side. There's gonna be uncertainty. We won't be able to accurately predict how long things will take. We will never be able to accurately predict the impact of changes. We'll never have all the information. There will always be some uncertainties and yet I have to make reliable commitments. There will be complexities. In this case, there would be interdependencies. There's going to be constraints of all sorts of types. There might be time constraints, resource constraints, budget constraints, policy constraints in terms of certain things that I have to comply with. And then lastly, there's the ambiguity when, when people have multiple objectives, how can you accurately predict which one they're going to be focusing on so that they don't end up local or short-term optimizing? So that's one of the problems that we've got in a project environment is that these tools that we have been given do not fully consider VUCA and yet we have to make reliable commitments. Even in the cases where we are able to do some simulation uh, modeling, um, typically what happens is the simulation is done on just a part of the system, a subsystem level, and often done to achieve just higher efficiencies or higher resource utilization. So when you have the, the wrong objective function, uh, then you, your optimum solution might be very much suboptimum. So that's the reasons why the current tools that we are given as managers in general, but specifically project managers, do not really equip them well for those three objectives. We have to make reliable commitments. We have to decide what's the best rules to use. Am I going to be using waterfall in this case? Am I going to be using critical chain project management? Will I use Agile or Scrum or a combination of these? What's the best way of deciding that? I don't have the luxury of, let's say, okay, the next project, we're going to make a change and then see how it goes. Uh, it's far too big risk. And then, of course, when things do go wrong and they will go wrong, should I intervene? Yes or no? Should I make change my commitments? So why simulation specifically? Well, firstly, most obviously, is simulation is the only technology that can fully consider VUCA. So you can build into your model uh, essentially something that's a pretty much a digital twin of the environment that you are managing in real life. A good analogy of that, imagine a, a digital twin of a driverless car, right? So we come up with what are the best rules to drive this car. We're not going to implement that in a real car and say, good luck. You're first going to create a simulation model with these rules. You will stress test the heck out of this, throw everything at it, let people walk in front of the car, see how it will operate. Let's see what will happen if it can't fully see a traffic light. Maybe there's sun shining on the traffic light. How is the, the, this driverless car going to react to those type of scenarios? If there's evasive action that it will take and there's, there's downsides on all the options, which way will it decide to go? These are all things that we can test, stress test with the simulation environment. So we can incorporate all of that VUCA type of considerations. But much more importantly, we can also accurately model human behavior. We can say, are there instances where humans will local or short-term optimize? 
and let's see if that has a significant impact on the overall goal of the system or not. The second part is that when we are using simulation, we can run it in a number of different ways. We can run it as a single scenario with multiple replications to see what the range of outcomes is going to be. Almost think about like a forecast for a typhoon or a hurricane. You can see that sort of funnel effect going forward where you can say the closer in time, the more narrow the distribution of possible outcomes, the further ahead into the future, the wider that range we can provide with a simulation model, we can provide you with that range of outcomes if you put in the variability. So if you can say what's the minimum likely and maximum uh, duration of specific tasks. Uh, and of course, you now have a huge pipeline of programs, project phases. We can run multiple replications and see what would be the best case scenario, what would be the worst case, and what would be the likely case. But we can also do, very importantly, sensitivity analysis. We can select one of the parameters. For example, the one that I will be presenting today is, we know that it's good practice to control the work and process. If you're starting everything as soon as possible, everything will take longer, you'll get much less done. You have to, you have to limit the work and process. But first of all, what's the mechanism that we use? Uh, should we limit it at the program, project, phase, or task level? And secondly, what is the number? What limit are we going to put? Uh, are we going to limit it to, to five programs, to 10 programs, to 15? What we can do with sensitivity analysis is rerun the model, multiple replications, step, stepping it up with each of those parameters that we are interested and see what the graph looks like. You can imagine the sort of an inverse U where to the left of that inverse U is, we clearly have too little uh, in work and process. We're now starting to starve critical resources. On the right of that inverse U would be too much. We are constantly causing people to multitask and somewhere around that middle, that Goldilocks zone would be, this is about the right amount. But we can also do scenario comparisons and test different rules against each other, including, for example, a, a hybrid rule that says, one way is we have a static limit. What if we created a dynamic limit? We specify the rules under which conditions this WIP limit should be increased or decreased. These are all things that we can do in a simulation before you actually ever have to implement it. So it provides us with a very low cost, low risk way of testing the impact of any change on both the operational and financial performance. We can incorporate all the financial side. For example, in this model, we incorporated all the variable and fixed costs. We, record, we incorporated all of the, the revenue side. At what point do you get revenue from your client? Is it when you are delivering phases? Is it when you're delivering projects or only at the program level? We can also build in penalties for late delivery or bonuses for early completion, run multiple scenarios and see how they work. And then the last component here, why simulation is a major breakthrough that we made a couple of years ago in the past, you could build these simulation models um, and it would take long. It would take maybe a simple model around three months to do the model building and, and data validation verification. But big models could easily take 12 and sometimes 24 months to do. And what we started testing was why can't we build self-configurable models completely from data? So imagine in this case, what I'll demo today is we asked the people to give us a complete export of their full project management portfolio. So that includes a full work breakdown structure showing all the programs, the projects that make up each program, the phases that make up each project, and even down to task list or checklist level that makes up those phases. We can read that in, we add variability to that, and as we're reading that into our platform, it builds a complete complete and accurate digital twin of that reality. So, of course, this conference is all about reaching for the goal. And I want to remind you, for those that have read the goal, the powerful example, a simulation model that Dr. Ellie Gold had included in the goal. For those that remember, it was the dice game. And it was a simple little factory that had five process steps. The output of each of the process step was determined by the throw of a dice. 
So each process could produce somewhere between one and six units per day, an average of three and a half. And the question was, if you ran this little factory for 20 days, how much would it produce? And of course, most people would say, well, as long as it can produce between one and six, and the average would be three and a half, it would be three and a half times 20 days, would be 70 units. Of course, we can turn this simulation into a project environment. And rather than producing units, the output would be the number of project tasks that you've completed. So if in this case, process A got a one, it meant that they could only complete one task that day. If they got a six, they could complete six tasks. The average would still be three and a half. What would happen if you actually played this game? And when people play the game still today, they are absolutely shocked when they see that they get about half out of what they expect. That's a 50% loss in the throughput or the output, 50% less than what they've committed to. Why does that happen? Well, it's, it's, it's very simple in a production environment. If process A only got a one, it doesn't matter whether the potential for B, C, D, and E all was to be able to produce six. If it only got one, it could only work on one and only one will be completed. And again, it doesn't matter if A, B, C, D all had fantastic days and all got sixes out that day and E only throws a one and only gets one out. So you get a massive skew distribution when you were expecting a very nice uniform distribution. And that skewed distribution is against you. You're getting about half out of what you expect. Now the question is, why is this the case? And I wanna introduce a simple classification here, which I've used. Uh, there's a number of different ways of classifying system complexity. For me, there's just basically three levels. There's a chaotic system. A chaotic system is a system that not only has multiple constraints, but these constraints are interactive. They feed each other. And as a result, the bottleneck is moving all the time. That type of system, like this very simple dice game, it's really impossible to predict what will come out of the system. You're always going to overestimate how much you'll get out, and the variability will be quite substantial. The second type of, of system is a complex system. A complex system has multiple constraints, but they are not interactive. We can achieve that outcome in the dice game by adding buffers in there. That will kind of break those dependencies, kind of decouple these resources from each other. So if A was lucky to get six out date and B only got a one, those five additional tasks can go into the buffer, and for the next round, when maybe A got a one and B got a six, uh, B won't be starved because there will be tasks or units waiting for it in each buffer. That definitely helps. And you can play the, the simulation game. We've got a, a Goldwitz Dice Game version that we will share. It's at the Goldwitz Dice Game. It's a free uh, app that you can download and play around with it. Um, but what you'll see is if you get the buffers uh, right, uh, you've made a commitment of 70, and you can actually substantially improve the performance by just adding the buffers to decouple it. So you've taken a system with interactive constraints that's chaotic. You've moved it from a complex system that has multiple constraints, but they are at least not interactive. And you could typically increase your output from about 30, 35, all the way up to about 50 tasks or units per month if the month is 20 days. That's a substantial improvement, but there's still a problem in that you are still 30% less than what you expected to produce. So you are not meeting your commitments to both your customers as well as to your shareholders. And now the question is, how do I get to a better number? Say for example, I was willing to accept that I'm not gonna get 70, I'm willing to commit to about 60. What is the best way to get to 60? Well, on the previous round, if I was getting 30 to 35, at some point you will start asking, we need to double up capacity. If you wanna get close to 60, 70, I need to double up on all my resources. That of course will cost a lot of uh, money and probably even time to get all those resources on board. The problems with the, the buffering side is that because these resources are balanced, 
you don't have the surplus capacity in any of the resources to build up buffers where it's needed. So that also has limited potential. The solution that I developed as part of my PhD was a very simple solution that said, what if we took one of these processes, in this case, it could be process A, but we could have selected process C or maybe even E, and we reduce its potential. We say, we're not going to allow you to throw sixes. If you throw a six, you have to throw again. That will limit its output between one and five, which means an average output of only three per day. So that will immediately change our commitment because we now have a clear bottleneck. And that's what a simple system is. A simple system has just a single constraint. All the other resources have sufficient surplus capacity that they do not become constraints at any point in time or for a substantially long enough period of time. So having the single constraint, if we're going to make our commitments based on the constraint performance, immediately will change our commitment to 60. As long as we make sure that we, we don't starve process A and that there's always buffer available, space available in A, B, essentially what will happen is the system will start performing at the level of the, which the constraint would be performing. And in this case, when we ran it, we, get, we got very close to 60 units out. A was never starved. It was never blocked because we had a, a enough buffer of AB. There was substantially uh, buffers allowed in between the others to prevent that starvation blockage. And suddenly we're getting more out just by actually slowing down one of the processes, very counterintuitive. So that's just an analogy of how the dice game was incredibly powerful to say, how can controlling the release or choking the release, making sure that we, we are not running at maximum capacity, but we essentially put the slowest resource at the front and that dictates the pace of the whole system. This is a very simple but very powerful way of actually not just increasing the output and, and shortening the time it takes you to achieve that, but to close the, the dramatic gap between the commitments that we've made and what our actual performance is. So let's go back to the case study that was uh, the objective for this presentation. Uh, a couple of years back through one of our partners, we were approached by one of the largest gas turbine manufacturers in the world. They said that they had created a competitive advantage by offering penalties and bonuses. They had a fantastic pipeline of programs that they were uh, going to be delivering. Um, it was about a five-year pipeline. They expected uh, just over $120 odd million dollars of, of profits from, from this. But they were about a year into this, and they had some concerns. There were some already delays and some rework that had to be done. And they were worried about whether this is going to be large enough in order to, to require them to change their commitments on either lead time or cost to their customers. But another thing that was worrying the, the team was that they kept on quoting the same lead times uh, based on their catalog for this type of gas turbine. And in the meantime, a backlog had been developing. And they realized that they weren't considering the backlog when making these commitments. So were they going to be able to deliver this project on time? So essentially what we worked with our partner is to say this is an ideal opportunity where building a dynamic simulation model, a digital twin of this environment, could be extremely useful because we could be answering those questions directly, not just what the operational uh, impact will be, but also the financial impact of these of these delays and, and errors or, or defects that they've had so far. And then we can test various rules. We can say, if you are making the typical mistakes that we've identified typically on, on managing projects, both on the making commitments, on the planning and execution and improvement side, we can then test what if we implemented very specific critical chain project management rules that will help us to reduce or even avoid those commitments. So first, just briefly covering the rules. For me, the logistical solutions of theory of constraints is all just simple heuristics, simple rules, each designed to prevent common decision mistakes. So the first mistake that we, we have noticed here that they were concerned about is as there were delays, they were starting all their programs and projects and phases as soon as possible. 
So in this case, a practical example, we're going to have work in process of free at any point in time. That has consequences because everything will take longer, we'll get much less done. The second mistake that they've made is they've allowed their resources or almost forced their resources to multitask. Because as soon as you start project one, two, and three, those, those customers expect you to report progress. And that will generate a, a, a demand on you to constantly switch tasks, both task switching and project switching, in order to show the progress. Um, and that will add to further delays. And then the last one here is a very interesting one is where we are asking the question, well, if we're starting to notice that things are, are going to take longer, will it help to start holding people accountable, to turn their estimates into commitments? Will that help or harm? Now, we know for ages what happens if you start turning estimates into commitments. So in this case, the estimate was that this task under perfect conditions will take about 10 days to complete under perfect conditions simpler than we expected we had everything that we needed best case scenario 10 days worst case scenario probably about 50 days a likely scenario which we we estimated was around 30 days what happens if you turn an estimate into a commitment there would be two reasons why you're going to change the shape of that distribution is the one is that imagine this team completed it in 20 days, but they made a commitment for 30 days. They don't want to be viewed as unreliable. They don't want the next time they give an estimate of 30 days for it to be cut to 20 days. So there will be an incentive for them to report it as 30 days rather than as 20 days. But there could be another reason why a 20-day delivery becomes a 30-day reporting duration is that we've asked for 30 days, we were given 30 days, there's always additional things that we can do and that's the Parkinson's law side. So what we wanted to do is to say, okay, we know that from a theory of constraints perspective, critical chain project management advises that you need to limit your WIP. Uh, you need to be pipelining these programs or projects based on some simple mechanism. We have tested two mechanisms in this simulation using programs to limit WIP or projects, and we also model the hybrid environment. The second CCPM rule is single tasking with full kitting. So focus and finish, start the project, work until you can no longer make progress on that project, only then switch over um, and make sure that there's a full kitting person in place to ensure that project two is ready when you start working on project two. Then do the same thing with project three, make sure that there's a full kit available so that by the time that you finish project two and you are ready to start project three, it really is ready to start. So it's a combination of single tasking and, and, and uh, full kitting that prevents this mistake where we are losing a lot of time due to task switching and project switching. And then the last part is, of course, honest reporting. That just don't turn an estimate into a commitment. And there's, there's also one of the ways of, you, of benefiting from that is to, to aggregate the buffers, use a project buffer that can definitely contribute to that. So those are the three, three mistakes that we wanted to model. If this company made these three mistakes how long is it actually going to take what will be the real net profit and how much better could they do if they simply implemented these simple rules to try and reduce or even avoid these mistakes so let's step through a, a quick demo and then uh, i will be handing over to jacob and fossler now to do the, the the demonstration of this model thank you for the introduction alan so the objective of the simulation model was to build a completely self-configurable simulation model that we will be able to use to simulate any project portfolio environment through the exports available out of a project management system. We were interested in a couple of outcomes for each scenario, the likely project portfolio completion date, the program and project due date performance, the main causes for delays, as well as the financial performance. For this project, we were going to simulate four different scenarios. The first scenario was going to be the traditional project management rules, which causes the main decision mistakes, the three main decision mistakes that Alan covered previously. 
The second scenario that we were going to simulate was to focus and finish scenario that prevents multitasking where we did work control at the project level. The third scenario was to also prevent multitasking, but this time control the work at a program level. And the fourth scenario was a hybrid rule that we created where we limit the whip at a program level, but also monitor the, monitored the backlog in front of critical resources. And as soon as that re backlog gets too low, there's a risk that we might be starving those critical resources. What the rule then does is it detects whether critical resources are at risk of being starved, starved. it overrides your whip control limit, and then releases another program that requires those critical resources. Um, in order to ensure that you don't waste the capacity of that resource. Now, the model architecture is actually quite simple. The model setup is basically taking an export out of your project management system, like Microsoft Projects, and importing that into an Excel document. Now, your work breakdown structure will consist of programs, um, the projects that make up these programs, as well as the phases that makes up, make up the projects, resource um, allocations, durations, and estimates assigned at a phase level. Inside the Excel sheet, we then add in the additional resources and data required, like for example, the locations, what projects are locations dependent, the resources, the resources at specific locations, the penalties uh, for late completions and bonuses for early completions, as well as the distribution of project durations. So in order to add, add variability to the simulation, we ask the project managers, what is the earliest time that you could complete a phase, as well as what is the longest? So, and this was all part of the parameters that could either be changed as part of the model setup or during the simulation runs. Now inside the simulation, we modeled task switching. Um, we modeled the project prioritization. Uh, you could choose between static and dynamically allocating resources as well as modeling the complete financials of bonuses and penalties, as well as some other TOC best practices. And since we added the variability, we were able to run the model in three ways. You could either run it as a single scenario, where you view the projects being completed as the model executes. You could also do a sensitivity analysis, where you choose a specific parameter and then increment it in predetermined steps and see what is the impact on the key performance metrics. And then the third mode, which we're going to be demoing today, is a scenario comparison, where you literally compare different ways of managing your projects. The output of the model um, is, can either be viewed inside of the model, uh, or in Excel reports, or in log files. So now for a quick demo of the simulation model. When you first run the model, you are able to learn some more information about the model, or for this demo, we're just going to get started. The model will then ask you whether you want to upload your own project portfolio or the default file. Just a quick review of what the Excel file looks like. We've got separate sheets for the different locations, all the resources, um, the resource counts, the work breakdown structure in detail containing prerequisites, the number of resources used, the bonuses and, and penalties, as well as the program priorities. All of, the, all of this is fed into the model and the model then dynamically creates this digital twin. The first thing you see once the scenario is loaded is a nice summary of your project portfolio. So as you can see here, there's 105 programs, 355 projects, 1,366 phases, 11 resource types and six locations. The project's gonna start here in March, 2016 and end early January, 2022. There's um, a net profit of 146 million, we can also view the Gantt chart, which will give you a nice overview of all the projects, which we can view by programs or projects um, and by program priority. Now, once we've viewed the Gantt chart, let me just get the video out of the way, we are also able to view some additional parameters that you can set up per round. So for round one, we can define the days um, that resources work on a specific task before switching and what is the days lost and then also apply Parkinson's law uh, which Alan will discuss in more details later. We can set the whip limits for the specific rounds for projects programs uh, or for round four the hybrid rule. We can also calculate these 
um, you can define execution speed using program priorities and whether or not you're going to allocate additional resources or not. Um, we obviously, due to time limit, covering most of these things very briefly, uh, more of it is available on our website. So for this, I'm just quickly going to view the first round. This is going to be a run a perfect round without any variability. As we let the model run a bit, we'll be able to analyze the due date performance. As the model is nearing completion for our first round in the perfect world, which is just no variability, we are able to see that we are slowly eating up the times, uh, the days available before we reach the end of the planned days, and we are already late, and most of our programs have not finished on time, the projects are not finished on time, the phases are not finishing on time, and this is all with zero variability, and it's mostly due to using the traditional project management rules. So if we dive a little bit deeper into the portfolio performance, we can view the fever chart. We can see a lot of project, projects um, consuming much more than the uh, allocated buffer. We can view the throughput. Uh, we can view the WIP as either the number of programs in uh, active programs that have already been started, the projects being started, the phases, we can view a detailed GAN chart. Let's click here to view the detail. We can view it either on a program project or on a full detail level, which will give us um, the details up to a phase. We can see how it's consuming the buffers. If we move back, we can look at the resources. What's the resource utilization? We can view this for each and individual resources. We can see the demand placed on that resource. What's the available hours for that specific resource? Uh, we can view some more detailed statistics on the delays, what's the causes of the main delays, waiting for full kit, waiting for resources, waiting for resources to start or to complete the WIP, and how much time is spent actually executing. Uh, we can also view some detailed financials, as we can see with this perfect world round one traditional project management rules, we are already seeing a loss. Alan will cover this in more detail in the next section. I'll hand over now to Alan, who will take care of the detailed discussion around the results. So, thank you very much to Jakob Ben for demoing the, the model. I'll present the results that we got, very, very interesting results. So, I'd like you to picture uh, a board meeting and we are reporting back the results that we've just generated from running this model and essentially what we are doing as Jakobin showed is we're going to be clicking the play button and see what will happen there's a pipeline of about five to six years how long will it actually take to get all those programs and projects and phases to be completed how many of those will be on time and are we going to be making the amount of net profit that we expected. Well, we ran these four scenarios. The first scenario was the baseline scenario. That is, if they didn't implement any of these critical chain project management rules, that they made those first two types of mistakes. They're starting to start everything as, as soon as possible, and they are uh, uh, almost forcing people to multitask because they need to show progress. Uh, and then uh, report that progress. And what you can see, the results are pretty devastating, is the target was to complete in January 2022. The likely completion date will be September 2023, 590 days later than expected. The best scenario that we got from the other three rounds uh, round two was controlling at the project level. That gave us about a 537 days earlier result. So actually finishing on the 14th of March, which is only about two months after uh, the, the original commitment. The hybrid rule gave us uh, um, the 24th of February, 2022, 555 days earlier. But the best result was actually achieved by controlling WIP at the program level. And that allowed us to complete 614 days earlier than what they would have if they didn't change the rules. What would be the impact on the financial side? 
the original target was to make about 146 million uh, net profit. The actual was losing over 100 million in that round one. That's almost a $250 million swing, a quarter of a billion dollars difference between what you committed to make for your shareholders and what you most likely will make if you don't change the rules. The best scenario was actually round one in terms of profitability. And you'll notice there that it, uh, it increased the profitability by 268%, so massive increase and substantially higher than even the targeted net profit. The, others, the other rounds were all profitable, but not as much as, as round one. Inside of the model, as the model is running, um, Jakuben showed you that you can see dynamically. So we're running all eight scenarios using multiple cores of the computer. All eight scenarios we can run in, in, in parallel. So you can actually see on this fever chart all the, all the projects and programs you can see on the, on the first scenario is going to be late. It's ending up in the, in the gray. Uh, Jakuben mentioned that we are running eight versions here. The top row there is on the perfect world. We want to see how the, the, the system performance is impacted if there is no variability in task duration. That's perfect world. Real world is what if there was variation. So how we compensate for that in our simulation is we are sampling maybe in that distribution of somewhere between 10 and 50 with a, a, a likely number of, of 30 days. We sampling every time we run the distribution and that specific number that we pick will then be used for all eight scenarios for that specific round. When we replicate it again, we'll pick a different number. And that's how you, can, you, you make sure that you are not fooled by randomness. So you can see in round one, no programs finished on time. Rounds two, three, and four, a number of programs finished on time. Some were finished late. But that's where you can become clever and say, OK, let's make sure that we prioritize based on the uh, those programs that have penalties for late completion or bonuses for early completion, we can put those first, make sure those are the ones that we deliver on time. Maybe those are the most critical for the company. And those which might not necessarily have penalties for late completion or bonuses for early completion, those are the ones that maybe if you have to be late on some programs, those are the ones that would be okay to slip. As the simulation is running, um, Jakobin also showed that you can see in direct action what the WIP levels will be, and you can select whether to watch it at the program level to see if, if it's adhering to this WIP limit. Uh, you can watch it at the project level, and you can also watch it at the phase level. And you can see how different those distributions are. The red line is always the baseline where there's no WIP limits being applied. And also, as the simulation is running, you can see the impact it will have on your resource utilization. So you can see here on round one massive increases uh, or overloads on the resources because you're not controlling the release of work in process. Whereas with the right WIP limits for both projects and programs, you can control the release of WIP so it's not overloading your resources in those scenarios. The request part or backlog, you can see if I'm interested while the model is running to see if a specific resource ever became a bottleneck. That's essentially, was there any evidence that at any point in time over this period, there was a substantial backlog of requests for their attention uh, waiting for them. And I can see here resource engineering one type resources, there was never any backlog for them. So, so really, we probably have too many of those resources. We can take some of those away, rerun the model and see if it has uh, impacted ne in any negative way the performance. And then for those that we are picking up in this case, engineering manager two, you can see there are substantial backlogs that can happen. So, so that was what we presented. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, um, you can imagine sitting there in this boardroom, you press the play button and they literally see how those profits that they were hoping will be realized are evaporating in front of their, in front of their faces. Uh, a massive swing in profitability of about a quarter of a billion dollars. Can we do better? Yes, we can do a lot better just by changing these rules. And then one of the managers, but what about this? What if we don't implement these rules and we just 
putting accountability. We just say to the project and task managers, you guys made commitments. We're going to hold you accountable to, to meet these commitments. What will happen? And of course, we can model that from a perspective of this is kind of with and without Parkinson's law. So as I mentioned, the two things, I'm, I'm turning an estimate into a commitment. What will happen? Will it help or will it harm? And literally, rather than without the Parkinson's law, we were 590 days late. We're now going to be 690 days late. Rather than losing... Uh, around uh, 100, and, uh, 100 million dollars, we're now going to be losing 150 million dollars. So it definitely didn't help; it only harmed. And that's our presentation for today. So, as a summary, year what we were able to show with this project is that managers are often put into positions where they have to make reliable commitments. Unfortunately, the planning tools that they have don't fully consider VUCA. And as a result, they cannot make reliable commitments. Secondly, they have to decide what rules they're going to be using for planning and executing the work and when to, to, to make changes. And again, the only viable way of doing that is literally run a proof of concept. But that's way too big risk. And that's one of the main reasons why companies keep on using the old rules, because they feel it's simply too high risk to try it on the next program or the next project. With the simulation model, you can address both those. You can run multiple scenarios and see what the commitments are that you, can, that you can reliably and comfortably make on both the time as well as the budget side. But you can also test the impact of different rules. And we know the critical chain project management rules have been specifically designed as very simple heuristics. They're not precise rules, but they're good enough to prevent some of the common decision mistakes that are made in both planning and execution and ongoing improvement. And then the last part is that these simulation models is not just usable when you are making these big changes or considering a big change, but they can actually be used on an operational basis to be able to read in the status of your, of your portfolio right as it is right now, read it into the model and be able to put, press the play button and see what's likely going to happen. So maybe there was a massive delay in receiving a, a critical component from a supplier, or maybe there's a pandemic that have just broken out like what we're dealing with at the moment. And you want to see how is that going to impact your operational or financial performance. You can create an event with that specific scenario that has happened, introduce that event into the model at a specific time, show how long the duration will be, what's the various strategies that you want to test in terms of recovering, press the play button and see what the outcome will be. So I hope that was valuable. What we'll do now is we'll open it up, up for, for any questions and we look forward to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to hearing your questions now.